This morning, I brought one of my favorite toys. This is a basketball. I wish I was, had big enough hands to be able to palm it, but I'm not able to do. But what I want to teach you this morning is how to shoot a basketball. Because so many people I've watched, as they play a little bit of basketball, and they, they don't shoot properly, and the ball goes all over the place and no consistency. So I want to teach you how to shoot a basketball properly. This is the way that I was taught, and I'm going to teach you so all of you can enjoy the game of basketball. It's not as fun, quite as fun as ice cube, but it's almost as fun as that, okay? So if you're going to shoot a basketball, you need to make sure that your feet are about shoulder width apart. I'm right-handed, so my foot, right foot is just a little bit closer, farther ahead than the other one. My shoulders need to be perpendicular to the basket. If I'm like this or like this, the ball is going to go all over the place. It has to be square. I'm going to put one hand behind the ball. Most people I see making mistakes shoot the ball with two hands. You never know where the ball is going to go. One hand behind the ball, elbows straight, aiming at the basket. I was practicing before we set up this morning, so to make sure I had this right. Okay, one hand is steady, and then when you bend your knees a little bit, I can't shoot it because I'm going to break something, but then you wave goodbye to the ball and you point to the direction you want the ball to go. If you go like this, it's going to go all over the place. It has to go there. And if, I want to show a picture of me and my basketball, back in my basketball playing days. Is it up there? Oh, it's going to take a minute. Okay, you'll see it in just a moment. That's how you shoot a basketball, and I hope I've whetted your appetite a little bit. I'll be more than glad to teach you a little bit later on, maybe afterwards that basketball is down, that net is down, and we'll be able to uh, shoot around a little bit. But you don't want to leave it to chance. If you're going to play a game, you're going to play a sport, you want to have the right technique, you want to have the right way of going about doing things. If you don't, then you're not going to get good results. It's going to be, the ball is going to go spraying all over the place. As we were playing ice cube, if you didn't have the right technique. There I am, there's back of my playoff, my playoff uh, when I played basketball. That was me during the 1988 um, slam dunk contest. You recognize me? Yes, there I am. But you can be very sincere about really trying to, to play the game and you want to play well, but if you don't have the right, te right technique and you don't know what you're doing, the ball goes all over the place and you don't have as much fun. We all need practical guidance for many areas of life. If you're going to put together IKEA furniture, you, you need some guidance. You're not sure where everything goes and how it all fits together. If you're going to repair a garage door opener, which I'm going to have to do in the next week or so, so that my wife's car can get in the garage and not be covered with snow every morning, I'm going to have to get onto YouTube to learn how to do that and get some pointers. If you're going to play a musical instrument, if you're going to fill out a tax return or, or do all these sorts of things, we need some practical guidelines. And I want to refer to a verse in Luke 11, where Jesus was praying, it says, and he was in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. There's a lot of interesting things we could observe about that verse. But the disciples are watching Jesus and watching his life, and they observe that he is a man of prayer. Why did Jesus have to pray? Lots of things that we could think about, and lots of things we could discover about that. But he didn't need to confess, and, and he didn't have a whole lot of maybe uh, needs that, that we would have. Um, he certainly had an internal perspective on life because he knew where he had come from and knew where he was going. So why did he need to pray? It seems that it was just about relationship. He wanted to be with his heavenly father and spending time with his heavenly Father as he had for all of eternity. We notice that John the Baptist apparently taught his disciples to pray. Uh, Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them to pray. They didn't really ask them how to pray. They just teach us to pray. More general, how to pray, but also like why pray and where to pray and all these sorts of things. And if this is true, then what we can learn from this is that prayer is something that can be taught and something that can be learned. We can learn this. It may not be natural for us, and we respect that and understand that, 
but it's something that can be learned as we see the value of it and get some uh, guidelines to help us. We've been working through this sermon series called No Connection, a troubleshooting guide for prayer. We all find this a challenge, all of us, because we're in prayer, we're having to admit our dependence and our, our humility, our need for God, that we can't do life on our own. We're admitting that right up front. Every time we pray, I need God. I need him in some way in my life and to intervene on my behalf in some way. First week, we talked about the power of prayers and the possibilities that are a part of it and also our privilege that we get to talk to God. That is what prayer is. It's, it's talking with God and talking to God. God is a conversation with him. We're invited to approach God's throne of grace with confidence to receive what we need. Week two, we talked about the pitfalls of prayer, some of the things that get us mired and help uh, just cause us sometimes not to, to experience the fullness of what God wants us to know in, in prayer. And this week, we're going to talk about some of the practicalities. Now, I showed you with a basketball some of the practical steps of what you have to do and how you, what the technique is to shoot a basketball properly. Well, we're going to try to do that um, with prayer. Be very specific, be very practical to encourage all of us in our prayer lives. However, you need to understand this. I can teach you everything I know, which is not a ton. I can teach you everything I know, though, about how to shoot a basketball but if you don't go get your own basketball and find a net and practice your shot yourself, you're never going to play basketball. You'll never be able to dunk a basketball like I did during the 1988 uh, slam dunk comp. You won't. You have to take the initiative. You just have to. I can't do it for you. I can't teach you to have a 40-inch vertical. I can't teach you that, all right? Same thing is true with prayer. At some point, each one of us has to take the initiative for our prayer lives. Nobody, we, we can pray for one another, but we can't pray for you to, to get, to, to, to be the ones praying. Um, you, you have to be the one actually praying. You have to get involved in it. You have to actually do it. You have to take some responsibility yourself. So we can give you guidelines and tips, but at some point, you actually have to get involved in the process. And you need to see the value of it. I'm sure many of you are shaking your heads and saying, oh, I don't really see the value of basketball. I understand that. I, I can respect that. But in prayer, that is really at the core of what we believe as followers of Jesus. That when we pray, Jesus went on to say in that Luke 11, when you pray, this is how you pray. Not if you pray, but when you do, it is assumed that that is a part of your life. So the more you practice, the better your technique, the more accurate you'll become. That's true in basketball or any other sport or instrument or whatever other skill there is in life. And also the more joy you will receive from it because you have a sense of, I, I know more of what I'm supposed to do so I can practice it and implement it in our lives. In prayer, no one can do it for you. You must commit to doing it. And if there's no power, we need to ask the question, are you plugged in? Are you powered on? Do you have a relationship with God? Have you trusted Jesus Christ? We sang songs that talked about Jesus being the lion and the lamb. We sang songs about, uh, about the precious blood of Jesus that was shed. That's why we're able to come to the altar. We're able to have a relationship with God through Jesus. That's why we talk about the fact that we are here and committed at Renew Church to helping people find a new faith, new focus, new frontiers in Jesus that new faith in him, trusting Jesus and trusting him alone. That's how we get plugged in or, or powered on with God. Well, what keeps us from praying? What are some no, no connection problems, some troubleshooting? Uh, we want to troubleshoot some of the common errors here. Some questions that often come up. Uh, we'll ask the question, will God hear me? Will God actually hear me? And uh, Proverbs 15, 29 says this, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. And we talked about that as one of the pitfalls. If we're living wickedly, if we're far from God and estranged from him, then he's not going to, it actually says he's not going to hear the prayer of the wicked who aren't following him at all. But the righteous, the people who are trusting Jesus, he hears the prayer of the righteous. 
God's word assures us that he hears us when we call upon him. And that is so encouraging to know that he does hear us. He may answer in very different ways than we expect or want, but he hears us. And every father, every parent is attentive to the voice of his or her child. We can pick out our child's voice. And God's answers may vary, but he hears us. And that is assuring to us. Well, some people will say, well, isn't there a set of rules for this? It's a set of rules for how we're supposed to pray and how we're supposed to go about things. And if I don't follow the rules, then God's not going to hear me and he's not going to answer my requests. Well, we need to understand that prayer is a conversation with God. And so the same sorts of rules that we understand in a conversation, listening, hearing, talking, being respectful, all those sorts of things are part of a conversation with God. We remember who we are speaking to. We are speaking to the almighty, sovereign Lord. He is in control of all things. He is the uh, one who uh, is all-powerful and can answer and has a plan for things, but he is the holy God. But he's also the one who loves us. He invites us to come to the altar, so to speak. He invites us to come into relationship with himself. His arms are open wide. And it's so important for us to remember that as we worship the Lord and also as we pray to him, that he is the God who, he's not against us. He's for us and he wants us to know him and to be known by him. And he's created us for his glory and for our ultimate good. There are no real rules to proper language or length or content. Uh, I can recall growing up that there were a number of individuals when I was a small child hearing people pray in church, and many of them grew up with the King James Version of the Bible, and so their prayers reflected the King James Version. Lots of these and thys and thous and heretofores and all this kind of stuff in there. Nothing wrong with that if, that, if your mind is so... Um, saturated with the Word of God in that particular version, wonderful. But God doesn't answer Shakespearean English better than other English or other languages or whatever. The key is to be sincere and real with Him, uh, to be honest before Him, specific, to be persistent, focused, and regular with our time of prayer with the Lord. We're going to look at some of those practical things in just a couple of moments. Many of us struggle with this question or this comment, I never have enough time to pray, right? Have you ever struggled with that? Life seems so busy, breakneck speed, you never know where to fit in some time to spend some time in prayer. However, I have learned in my own life that I can make time for what matters most. I really can if I really want to. Uh, there may be days that are crazy hectic, but most days I have some control over my time and I can rearrange my time as I need or maybe offload some activities to make time for prayer. If we have time to watch TV, if we have time to go on YouTube and watch viral videos, if we have time to Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook or all those sort of things, if we have time every day for those sorts of things, guess what? We have time to pray. And we may have to offload a few of those things. And that's probably one of the biggest distractions that we have in our modern world. There are so many other things competing for it. And many, sometimes some very, very good things, but there's a lot of stuff that's just filler. Right? Am I the only one that struggles with this? You know, Pinterest. Oh, what, what happened? Right? You know, Pinterest comes on and you're chasing something else. We have time. We just need to arrange, re rearrange the time. Prayer does not have to be also, we've said this before, prayer does not have to be eternal in order to be immortal. It can be short. And so many of the prayers in Scripture are very short, but they're focused, they're sincere, they're passionate, they're very specific. It's a cry, remember? Prayer is a cry of dependence and desperation. God, I need you in my life in this situation that I'm facing frequent, fervent, specific cries of desperation and dependence. That's what prayer is all about. And for most of us, we can make use of that. You can turn your car into a chapel 
by turning off the news or turning off the music and spending some time in prayer. I put my little ear thing, my little uh, hands-free thing in my ear, so what if I'm talking with, it might not even be on, but I just, if people are looking at me and I'm talking by myself in the car, at least it looks like I may be talking to somebody else. But I can have a conversation with the Lord. And seriously, sometimes you are stuck in traffic, right? What can we do with that time? I remember a retired missionary saying years ago, uh, saying how she used her car, as, turned her car into a chapel. Brilliant. We can do that. How about another thing that often comes up for us? We say, well, I, I'm not in the mood to pray. I don't feel like it. Well, if we feel like doing things that are kind of disciplines in life, then we'll never get around a certain thing. I mean, we're never going to do the dishes if we just want to feel like it, right? We're never going to brush our teeth, right? We don't feel like it. Not in the mood. Uh, we're never going to fix a leaky, leak, a leaky faucet. We're never going to change our car's oil. We're never going to ask or extend forgiveness. We're never going to pay our bills or taxes if we're going to wait until we're in the mood. There are things that we know we need to do. We need to discipline ourselves and do them. And all of life involves discipline. We need to complete what we must so we can do what we wish. We must complete what we must in order to do what we wish. And then sometimes people will say, well, I don't know where to start. How do I get started in prayer? How do I go about doing it in a very practical way? Appreciate the honesty. And that's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to go on from here. And that's why we're doing this whole series. So what are some practical tips for prayer? Ready to send a getting started, started guide? Let's start off with Jesus' example. Wonderful example to begin with, of course, our Savior again connecting with the Father, staying in that intimate relationship, carrying on that real relationship uh, with Him. Uh, Luke 5.16 says this, But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus often, regularly, made the habit of getting uh, away and getting a time of prayer, setting up a time. Often it was early in the mornings, we find, as you go through the Gospel of Luke and, and other uh, gospel writers will talk about it early in the morning or sometimes all night. Uh, he would find some time. Frequent prayer. Finding it doesn't have to be long. You don't have to set a timer and say, well, I've got to pray for at least an hour. You're going to set yourself up for failure. But for two or three minutes, concentrated, specific, fervent prayer, specific prayer. And then Jesus also found a solitary place, a quiet place, a place where he could just have a moment or a few moments to himself. I remember of hearing, I think it was Susanna Wesley, who was the mother of a whole whack load of kids, and she would, I don't know, had 12, 16 kids, a whole bunch of kids. This is a number of centuries ago. And what she would do is she would sit in her kitchen in a chair, and she would put her apron up over her head. And that was the signal to the kids, don't bug me, I'm spending some time with the Lord. And I think she ruled her household quite aggressively. And so the kids knew not to mess with mama when she's in that time of prayer. Whether that works for you or whatever, I understand busy households, but finding a time, finding a place. You may have to get up earlier. You may have to stay up later doing what you can to spend that time because it is so, so, so very important. Psalm 5.3 has the suggestion David is writing. He says, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait Expect, expectantly. And I have found that as true in my own life, to have some time in the morning before the day gets started, before all the urgent things come up that distract me and push all these other things out of my life, to spend some time with, uh, with the Lord in prayer and going into His Word. Early morning, less distraction time and prioritizing it early so that it does not get pushed out suggestion. That may not always work for you. You have to find that time that works for you, but that is a good time to, uh, to consider. Practical thing. Again, John 15, 7. We've looked at this verse. And it's kind of been the theme verse through our prayer series. If you, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, Jesus said, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Remind ourselves that Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. Apart from him, we can do nothing. That's why it's desperately important that we spend time with our Heavenly Father in prayer. We need to be connected to Him through 
Jesus. We need to reside in this real relationship with him. It is a 24-7 experience. It's not something we just do here on Sundays. This is important. We need to meet together as the body of Christ. We need to serve one another, worship together, encourage and fellowship with one another. But we need to also be walking with the Lord all week long, Monday through Saturday. Another scripture, Colossians 3, 16, tells us to abide in God's word, to let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Letting the word of God dwell in us. And so if Jesus, if we remain in Jesus and his word is remaining in us, those are the conditions for prayer. We can ask whatever we wish. And as his life and his word starts to inform our thinking and our hearts and our values, that will start coming out in prayer. We will start to pray what God's will is. We will understand what his will is. Along with that, we need to recognize the importance of persistence. It is an ongoing relationship, and it's important to be persistent in our conversation with God. And Jesus told a marvel, marvelous parable about the persistent widow, and I'd love to be able to take us through the actual text in Luke 18. But just to summarize the story, there's this unjust judge who did not care about God, didn't care about people. And this widow kept coming and bugging him every single day. Just kept coming at him. I want ju justice against my adversary. I want justice against my adversary. I want justice against... And he got fed up with it. And he said, finally, he says to himself, you know what? I don't fear God. I don't care about people. But this lady is bugging me so much, I'm just going to grant her request and get her out of my hair. Jesus says, listen to what the unjust judge says. And in all of this, and, and obviously he's, he's not saying that God is unjust, but the lesson is we need to be persistent. Don't give up. While there's still life, there's hope. If you're praying for an unsaved loved one, you keep praying for them. Uh, just this past weekend, I had a cousin of mine that we have been praying for years, for years and years and years, and he made a mess of his life in so many different ways. He actually was killed Saturday, Friday sorry, Thursday night on his little scooter by the side of the road. He was driving on the side of the road, and his life ended. We've been praying for him, praying for him. As far as we know, we don't think he ever actually made a commitment to Christ. We can stop praying for him now. But we need to keep praying for those, while well, there's still life, there is still hope. We keep praying for them, trusting God, asking God to intervene on their behalf, and not giving up, being persistent. I know there's other people who have prayed for years and years and seen family members and friends come to know Christ. It's just being persistent and not giving up on it. What does that actually look like? There's a couple of verses in Scripture uh, that call, call on us to pray without ceasing or pray continually. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, uh, the shortest, second shortest verse in the English Bible, Jesus wept is the shortest in English, but uh, um, to pray without ceasing, pray continuously, uh, without giving up. Colossians 4.2 says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And both of these verses are actually, they're commands. We're, we're told, we're to devote ourselves, we're to pray without ceasing. And so it's a matter of obedience. This is something that we can do. We can discipline ourselves to do this. We need to ask the question, well, how did Jesus do that? I mean, because we see Jesus, he was doing miracles, he was teaching his disciples, he was just living life as we do. He wasn't constantly on his knees in prayer, his eyes closed, his head bowed. So did Jesus obey these commands? And we would have to say, well, yes, he fulfilled the law, he fulfilled God's word perfectly. So what does it mean to pray without ceasing or constantly? What does it mean to devote ourselves to prayer? You can kind of trace the idea even through the early part of the book of Acts as people were just living life and as stuff came up, they lived life as if God was right there. So at any moment, in any situation, they would just call upon his name and pray. There were set times of regular prayer, but there were just spontaneous times of prayer. 
And that's what it means to pray without ceasing. At any time, in any place, in any situation, for any reason, you don't have to be in church. You can be in the Father's presence. In fact, we recognize that we're, we're God is everywhere. Our God is uh, everywhere present. And so there's no place that we can ever go where God is not. Wherever your workplace is, your home, your environment, this world in which we live, God is here. God is with us, and He is accessible to us. And so to pray without ceasing is to know that we're in this attitude of, at any time, at any place, I can pray. I can pray. We sometimes use the verse where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst. The amazing thing is where one believer is. God is there with him or her, wherever, wherever we are. So we can pray without ceasing. When Jesus filled, fulfilled that, the early church did, and anything that came up, they were just in the Lord's presence in prayer, and we can do the same. How about posture? What's the best posture to have in prayer? There is one that is a definite no-no, lying down. It doesn't work for me. Because if I start to pray when I'm lying down, I'm gone. I'm asleep. I can fall asleep at any time in any place. So I highly recommend don't lie down and pray unless you're trying to fall asleep. And then you won't, of course. But you see throughout the scriptures, people kneeling, uh, people standing, arms raised, arms down, whatever, um, uh, lying down, face down on the earth, all kinds of different things. It doesn't matter. The most important thing is the posture of your heart whether you are sincere, whether you're being real and honest before the Lord, that is what, it, is what the Lord is looking for. He's looking for us to humble ourselves and to be dependent upon Him. It's very hard to fall asleep when you're on your knees. Very, very difficult. And, uh, or standing up and whatnot. And that's uh, something that I've learned over the years. We're, our next practical point, I want to pick up a little video here. Uh, Pastor Merrick from Milton is uh, going to ask a couple of questions of Pastor Bartley, and uh, it's going to lead us into this next practical point on prayer. Hey guys, welcome to the last week of our prayer series. In, in this final week, we're looking at the practical how-tos, trying to get right down to it. And so we are going to pick the brain of our lead pastor, and I'm going to ask him for some advice on how do we do this. So Bartley, if you were to give us just kind of like one recommendation to our church in, in terms of what is the one thing you would recommend we do in our prayer lives? What would that be? Yeah, there's so many things I could pick, but as I thought about this question and narrowed it down, I would say the biggest one thing I would encourage people to do is just to pray with someone, right? Like Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in his name, right? There's something about this dynamic of being with other people in prayer that really sort of locks it in. It's, it's kind of a public witness. We we're doing something kind of before God and angels when we do that. Or there's something about it anyway that's more powerful, and I think it, it keeps us accountable at a different level. So that would be my, my right. one recommendation. So we're talking about going to, in your family, you're talking about going to your spouse, maybe your kids. Um, yeah. Otherwise, maybe your renew groups, who are we, who are we praying? Yeah, well, the renew groups are a natural thing, and that's one of the reasons why we do it. It's a big part of what we do in our renew groups, right? Get yeah. together and we pray. Um, even on a more day-to-day -day level, I would say like single people, find a, find a buddy somewhere that you can pray with, whether you do it over the phone, um, you know, sometimes you're driving to work, you can like, you know, just use Siri and talk over your Bluetooth, right? Or, right. you know, maybe a time and day where you can use FaceTime or Skype, because um, that's great technology. Um, if you can get together, that's awesome. But just to pray with someone. If you're married, just take some time, you know, before you go to bed or whatever, and just to pray with your spouse. And I mean, that's just good advice on so right. many levels for your relationship and everything. But there's something about praying, you know, with somebody else and praying out loud together and agreeing on some things together before God that it's just really healthy. Again, with prayer being about us aligning ourselves to God primarily, um, it's a great accountability tool. I know sometimes when I've prayed with my wife, I've, I've heard things from her heart that she hadn't shared with me, like in ever and and vice versa she's told me that like i didn't know you were thinking about that or right, that this right. was on your spirit and so on so it's just healthy on so many levels cool yeah. now i know for some of us um prayer life has probably been a really private thing and so praying with somebody is new um and it might be a little awkward do you have any tips on you know, how do you get started and, and step into this with somebody well, if both people take off their clothes and be become completely naked, um, the prayer seems much, much less uh, 
No, I'm just messing. Um, <laughs> I would say, you know, for me, I've thought over the years, we just need to get beyond the discomfort of it, right? Like, if I really believe in Jesus, I'm, I'm really a follower of Jesus, I have to get to the point where I'm willing to acknowledge him before other people. And, you know, finding a, a buddy or, you know, your spouse or whatever, that should kind of be a starting point for where you're able to do that. And, you know, this is kind of old school, but I, I often heard when I was younger, you know, Jesus hung on a cross naked for us. There's that naked thing again. But, you know, Jesus hung on a cross in, in shame before us, and he wasn't ashamed to do that, you know, bearing our sin. And so we just have to get things in perspective and, and realize, hey, this is something I need to, to do. It may be awkward. It may be uncomfortable, but we need to push through that. And I've seen people do that and be determined to do it, even the shyest people that made a determination to do it. And really, within a matter of a few weeks, became comfortable with it, right? So yeah. it's something we can do. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I hope you guys have found this uh, series valuable and that some of these tips will help you out. Uh, take this, talk about it in your Renew groups, talk about it in your families, and, and get out there and, and start putting some of this stuff into practice. Yeah. Pray with others. That's why we have our Renew groups. Uh, I would encourage you. I've uh, seen in some small groups just sentence prayers and just going around and everybody contributing a sentence. You don't have to go on long, but just a sentence, but in a sense, having a prayer together, crafting a prayer together as a group. It's a great way of building unity and uh, just helping us to get to the point of understanding how to uh, pray and learning it. And we can be real with one another. That's part of our, ooh, we want to be an authentic community. So that's why we have our Renew groups to do that. But as, uh, as was shared, find a partner to pray with. Jesus' pattern prayer, Jesus himself told us how to do that. A couple things that he said is don't try to do it to impress other people. That's not what it's all about. And he says don't also babble on like the pagans. More words doesn't make it more spiritual. It needs to be real. It needs to be sincere. And he gives us a pattern prayer. And you, many of you would be familiar with, uh, with his pattern prayer in Matthew 6. And that's a good place to start. To start and think, get into the scriptures together and, or for yourself and look through that prayer and see what you, uh, tips you can pick up from that. And that's one of the last things I would encourage you to do is to, uh, to pray through scripture. If you don't know what to say, use the scriptures as you're reading a verse or thinking about a verse or something that was up on the screen or something that was preached on a Sunday morning or in your own devotionals, whatever. Use that scripture and turn it into a prayer. You read somewhere in Scripture, oh, Lord, I'm supposed to love my enemies. Oh, dear, there's this guy who's beside me in my office or whatever, and he just drives me crazy. Lord, help me to realize that you've called me and put me there in a pur for a purpose. That person needs you to change their life. I need to change my perspective with that. Help me to love that person, not just with my emotions, but with my will and to do something to benefit them in some way. I, I, we just turn it into a prayer. What the Scripture says, a command that is in Scripture, or an example we see in Scripture, turn it into a prayer. You will never, ever run out of things to pray about if you pray through Scripture. Study the Psalms. The Psalms, most of them are prayers. It's, the Psalms are a unique kind of language in the Bible. Most, all of the other books are God or His prophet or whatever is speaking to us. But the Psalms go the opposite direction. It's us speaking to God. It's a totally different direction. And uh, it gives us the language that this is how we're supposed to approach, approach God. And if you read through the Psalms, the Psalm writers, often David, but other ones, are being very real with God, talking about their frustrations, their anxieties, their worries. Everybody's out to get me. Everybody's out to kill me. That's the language of prayer. That's how we're invited to go in, to be very, very real, very, very honest with the Lord. So study the Psalms to help us become people of prayer. And there are lots of resources, books, seminars, conferences, online resources. There are stuff all over the place to help us come across prayer. Eric suggested to our um, uh, executive team to look up something called Echo Prayer. So I looked at it and d downloaded it last night, and it's kind of cool. I haven't quite figured out how to work it yet and how we're going to use that, but I think in your Renew group, they're starting to use it right now. Echo Prayer. I believe it's available, both uh, Apple and Android has that capability. It's one more wonderful, wonderful 
resource. So hopefully that's giving you some tips, some ideas, some things that you can do to help you improve in your prayer life, which is so similar to any other skill or discipline you might be learning. Basketball requires right posture. I talked about your shoulders perpendicular to the basket, your feet shoulder width apart, knees slightly bent, right? The whole body is involved. I don't have the right posture. Same thing is true for prayer. You have to have the right posture of humility and dependence upon God. That's what's important. Not the words or how many words or how loud we are or whatever. All, all those things are peripheral. The most important thing is that we have the right posture. Basketball also requires right alignment. You've got to have the one hand behind the ball. I don't want to see anybody shooting with two hands, all right? One hand behind the ball, aligned up with the basket so you can shoot properly. It has to have proper alignment with the basketball net. And so does prayer. You need to align your life with Christ. You need to abide in Christ. His life flowing through us. Him the vine, we're the branches, and allow his life to flow through us and align our life with him. And then basketball also requires right follow through. You've got to wave goodbye to the ball and point to where you want it to go. Michael Jordan's famous last shot. That's what it was, pointing to our, towards the basket. Same thing is true for us. We need to be specific about what we're asking God to do so we know if he's answering and how he's answering. We need to be specific or we'll never know. And basketball, as well as any discipline, requires practice, and so does prayer. If you don't practice it, you will not get better at it. There's only one way. You have to discipline yourself to pray consistently and be devoted to it. So are you ready to play basketball? You ready to play? Are you ready to pray? Are you willing to get into the game? Are you going to stay stuck on the sidelines? It's much, much more enjoyable to be in the game and be a part of the game to play. We have... Uh, a prayer week that we are planning. You'll see our little box here that you can put in prayer requests. Uh, if you don't have a little sheet of paper, you can do the tear off of the Connect card and you can pop it in there if you want. Our prayer week, November 20th to 26th, you can go to Renew. You have to type this in, okay? You can't go to a website and go automatically in. You have to type in renewchurch.ca backslash 24-7 prayer and you will come to the sign-up sheet. There's a number of places that are still available. You can sign up for that week of prayer. And just remind ourselves that the persistent practice of prayer, remember the persistent practice of prayer is powerful.